and, but don't be uh, shy to ask questions anyways, right? So welcome here. This is going to be session 13 in our uh, uh, general introduction to apologetics for senior teens and, and little babies and whoever else wants to come. Uh, I thought we could uh, open with a word of prayer. Let's ask the Lord for his help uh, this morning so to just ensure that we have a really God-honoring, productive, fruitful, and encouraging time together. I want this to be enjoyable for everyone and, and um, useful. I want this to be useful for everyone as you engage with the, your own world, your own little evangelistic uh, ministry field, right? So, so let's do that. Let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, we come to the throne of grace to thank you, Lord, that you're, thank you for that you're so kind to us and uh, you show us so much grace and mercy. Uh, Lord, thank you that you, dis- you displayed your love for the world at the cross in spectacular fashion. Uh, those of us who know you in a saving way, thank you, O oh God, for your promise to complete the good work that you've started. And uh, Lord, while we're on the earth, we want to be effective and fruitful. And uh, Lord, we ask for your help today to get better equipped to engage with our world to share and defend this most holy faith. Uh, Lord, so we ask you by your spirit to minister to every heart and mind in this room today. And uh, may this be enjoyable and helpful for everyone who's come out. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, guys, so we are, we're still uh, looking at historical apologetics. Remember, we've done a few sessions now looking at the New Testament as accurate, reliable, trustworthy history. We're learning the truth about uh, what's gone on around here, uh, about divine action in the world, uh, in the person of Jesus in particular. Jesus touched the world, God in the flesh. He said some things. He did some things. The New Testament records all that for us. Uh, And the last few sessions, we were just looking at the historical record there presented to us in the New Testament. And we were treating the New Testament largely like any other historical document. So we're going to apply the ordinary rules of history to this collection of books that we call the New Testament. And uh, remember, when you apply the ordinary rules of history, the best conclusion you can get is a probable conclusion, right? This is induction, and you don't get certainty from induction. You get probabilistic conclusions. So applying just the ordinary rules of history to the New Testament, the New Testament looks very probably true. It looks very probable that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, It looks very probable that the text has not been tampered with or has uh, undergone some radical revision or something like that, right? Now remember, we, we really need to go the other way as well and ask what in the world justifies using these ordinary rules of historical investigation? And we said, it's the God of the Bible. He's the only one that can ensure that this universe is intelligible uh, and that your rational inquiries are going to get you anywhere near the truth. This has to be a God-created universe. And we need to be creatures uh, capable of learning things. And without the God of the Bible guaranteeing that, uh, any any kind of historical research or scientific research it's just really going to be a fruitless endeavor. You just have no guarantee that what you're doing amounts to a hill of beans, right? Get, get, everyone's getting what I'm saying, right? Okay. So um, it's not wrong to subject the New Testament to the ordinary rules of history uh, so long as, uh, you know, at some point, um, we, we really need to ask what justifies those rules. Now, what we want to do today, we want to look at some common questions and objections to the New Testament. And there's a lot, right? I mean, we only have one morning together, two sessions. We, we can only barely scratch the surface, right? But under God, I want to, tr- I want to try my best to look at the more common ones. Um, before we do that, though, I'd like to just get some free discussion going here. If someone was to ask us here in this class... Um, give me some reasons why I should trust the New Testament. Like, you know, the New Testament tells a story. It tells a story of Jesus. He came into the world. He did some things. He taught some things. He died. He was resurrected. 
uh, he was seen alive, he, he returned to heaven, then you have the story of the early church immediately after the ascension, and what the church was doing under Peter and then Paul. So you have this whole story there in those 27 books of the New Testament, but why should we believe any of that? What good reasons could we give somebody? And I'm just, let's just brainstorm. Just try to remember some of the things we covered. Maybe you've got things in your head that we didn't cover, and you think maybe we should have. But what, what, what are some things we could tell a person asking us to give them a reason to trust the New Testament as reliable history? What's something you could say? Say, why should I trust that book? What makes it better than the Quran? What makes it better than the Hindu Vedas or the Book of Mormon? You know, there are similarities between the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Why do I trust the Bible and not the Book of Mormon? The Book of Mormon was written by like one guy. Right. And the New Testament at least has many authors with talking about a group, a large group of people that did things together versus the Book of Mormon. I believe it's mostly Joseph Smith narrating visions he got. Right. Well, the, yeah. Just be precise. The Book of Mormon claims to be yeah, yeah. Uh, a collection of documents written by a bunch of different people over a span of, uh, say, 600 B.C. to like A.D. 421. That's the span. They say. That's a whole collection. And Joseph Smith claims to be the guy who found that document. An angel told him where it was buried. and He went and found it. Um, but he translated it, right? Yeah. Uh, but you're right, there is absolutely nothing corroborating that story. There's no textual history to that book. All we have is one document now, one translation, quote unquote, by this one guy. There's no paper trail to this thing. And where's the actual thing he found? Well, it's been taken into heaven now. So all we have is this, yeah. Yeah, okay, so we have, whereas the Bible, you're right, you've got multiple independent attestation. That's true. So that's one, that's, and there is a paper trail, isn't there, with the Bible. We do have a textual history. We have, how many people here remember the number of manuscripts that are out there, roughly speaking? Ancient uh, copies of the New Testament. Do you remember the figure? Something like 25,000 ancient copies, you know, in different languages, you know, written, originally written in Greek, but all kinds of different languages as well. Quotations by the early church fathers. Uh, and these ancient uh, copies of the New Testament, they find these all over the Roman Empire, the ancient from Egypt, Syria, I mean, all over the place. Uh, and there's variations, but the variations show that there was no uh, concentrated effort to force these documents to conform to some kind of standard. It wasn't a bunch of guys in a smoke-filled room deciding, here's the standard and, and we're going to make sure everything lines up with this. It shows us that people were copying these New Testament manuscripts independently of each other. And today we can put them all together and we can see that there was no systematic revision of the New Testament. So we have a, test, we have a textual history that shows uh, that the New Testament has not been corrupted. Um, but what kind of reasons could we give for um, our belief that this document is actually telling the truth or that these documents are truthful? You've got that they're well preserved. But you could have a well-preserved lie, too, couldn't you? Yeah? Uh, there's things in there which would be embarrassing if we were trying to construct a false presentation, like we wouldn't include things that are objectable to our own cause or to our own witness, like the listed women's testimony and parts of the, parts of the story are like, oh, well, that doesn't, that doesn't argue the best for our point, except it's in there, um, yeah, because it's true. Exactly. They call that uh, the criteria, a criterion of embarrassment. Why would you put hard to explain details in your in your documents, right? Um, we want to, the early church was trying to show that Jesus is Messiah. That was that was the first theological hurdle to get over. Let the Jews know that Christ is, or that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. Mayor Paul said the gospel goes to the Jew first and then to the Greek. So that, that's one of the reasons why I think Matthew is the first gospel written because they're trying to get over that first theological hurdle. Here, this Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. Okay, but why is it then that 
Jesus actually comes out and calls himself the Messiah so few times. I think there's maybe three times where he's pretty open about it, pretty blatant about it. Other than that, uh, he's calling himself the Son of Man, an ill-defined term. See? Uh, and in the second century, the early church fathers are constantly call, calling him the Christ, and very rarely do they call him Son of Man. So you, just, you kind of expect that this, if this is a fabrication intended to show that he's really the Christ, wouldn't, they be, wouldn't he be calling himself the Christ on every other page? You know, stuff like that. Uh, the early church wanted to show that Jesus is God. He is God in the flesh. Uh, and yet, why do we find things uh, in the gospel uh, such as Christ uh, affirming his ignorance about when he's coming back? He said, uh, the day or, that day or hour, no man knows. Not, not man, no man knows it. Not angels, not the Son, only the Father. You see, now that's a hard to explain fact. Now, of course, we understand that at incarnation, that divine person is now operating through a limited human nature. Uh, and so he can honestly say in his waking human consciousness, he didn't know. But, that, but that's a hard to explain fact. I mean, you've got to really start splitting theological hairs to even understand that. Why would, why would a, you know, a bunch of storytellers who are trying to, uh, they're writing fiction here to prove a theological point, why would they include a detail like that? Uh, remember, James, the Lord's brother, didn't believe in his brother. Why would you put that in John 7, verse 5? And yet James turns out to be one of the leaders in the early church. All kinds of little things like that. Um, and uh, this brings us to uh, this little issue called contradictions. And this will be our first. Um, by the way, if, if I could just uh, outline what we're going to do here under God. Uh, we're on page 11 in your notes. Um, and we have A, B, C, and D in your notes. We've already covered C and D at the beginning of this section on historical apologetics. So C and D, we're not going to go over again. Um, but we do want to look at this, uh, the supposed pagan influence over Christianity. And we want to look at the supposed Gnostic traditions and whether or not those are at least as good or maybe better sources of information about early Christianity than, than the New Testament. Um, but we're going to start off by looking at some contradictions. So if you, want to, if you want to amend your notes, point A is going to be contradictions, point B will be pagan influence, and then point C, the Gnostic traditions. So that's how we're going to amend those notes. So point A, contradictions. And this is what Lee, Lee Strobel had to say uh, in his book, The Case for Christ. He said, if the Gospels had been identical to each other, word for word, this would have raised charges that the authors had conspired among themselves to coordinate their stories in advance, and that would have cast doubt on them. Uh, remember, I cited uh, Simon Greenleaf, the royal professor of law, and his work, The Testimony of the Four Evangelists, that you can, I think it's still in print, you can get a copy of this. Uh, but he subjects the four Gospels to the kind of scrutiny that uh, a witness in a courtroom would be subjected to. And this is what Greenleaf said. He said, there's enough of a discrepancy to show that there, there could have been no previous concert among them, and at the same time, such substantial agreement as to show that they, all, that they were all independent narrators of the same uh, great transaction. And Craig L. Bloomberg, another scholar, a historical scholar, says, my own conviction is this. Once you allow for the elements I've talked about earlier, of paraphrase, abridgment, explanatory additions, or selection or of omission, the Gospels are extremely consistent with, with each other by ancient standards, which are the only standards by which it is fair to judge them. If the Gospels were too consistent, that in itself would, be, would invalidate them as independent witnesses. People would then say, we really have only one testimony that everyone else is just parroting. Uh, this man, Erwin Linton, says uh, much the same thing. He says, the frank and artless narratives of the Bible are so obviously indifferent to the appearance of consistency and show so clearly that, irreg that irregularity, which is the sure mark of honest, honest uh, handiwork in the oriental rug, and of spontaneity in human testimony that they have often lured opponents into attempts at destructive cross-examination, which have only brought the Bible's truth and consistency into a clearer light. William Paley, who remembers William Paley, the, the, the watchmaker argument? Remember that guy? He said, if you found a watch, 
you, even if you never saw one before, you knew that someone in intelligently designed the watch, put it together, right? And so he uses that kind of reasoning uh, in the created order. When you look at living systems, for example, uh, you, just, you just know that you're looking at something that was intelligently designed, okay? But anyway, uh, William Paley said this, now in historical researches, a reconciled inconsistency becomes a positive argument. First, because an imposter generally guards against the appearance of inconsistency, and secondly, because when apparent inconsistencies are found, it is seldom that anything but truth renders them capable of reconciliation. The existence of the difficulty proves the absence of that caution which usually accompanies the consciousness of fraud, and the solution proves that it is not the collusion of fortuitous propositions which, uh, which we have to deal with, but that a thread of truth winds through the whole which preserved every circumstance in its place. Now, that's very flowery language, but what all these guys are getting at is uh, if, the, if all four Gospels said the same thing almost word for word, you would, you would immediately become suspect. You would say, I don't think... This is, these are not really independent attestation here anymore. The, this is uh, collusion. This is, this is really only one witness being parroted. And so um, the fact that there are apparent discrepancies between the Gospels is proof positive that they are indeed independent. These are an independent attestation. It's also proof positive, I think, that the New Testament has not undergone substantial revision in its copying. Don't you think if the church was in the business of changing these documents whenever they felt the need, don't you think they would have smoothed over some of these apparent contradictions? But they just, they just left them as they were. They weren't going to mess with the text. And I like what Paley says here. He says, in historical researches, a reconciled inconsistency becomes a positive argument. And uh, I think as you study the Bible, you've probably already come up, uh, up against what have appeared to be contradictions. And under further inspection, you discover, oh, no, here's the way to reconcile this. I just needed to read a little bit more. Uh, how many people have bumped up against stuff like that. I mean, I have. As sometimes you need to just put those contradictions in the back of your mind on, on a shelf somewhere, and it might be years before you stumble upon the answer, before God actually shows you the answer, okay? But um, let's take a look at a couple of these uh, that we're talking about here. One of them is the genealogies of Christ. This, these are favorites. I mean, there's a lot. Um, but this is one of them here. In, uh, according to Matthew's gospel, Jesus uh, has a genealogy that goes all the way back to King David. And it's clear that his adopted father, Joseph, uh, it's his line that we're looking at. So it's Jesus up to his adopted father, Joseph, and then Joseph's father, and then all the way up the line, right? Um, and some people think they've seen a contradiction here too when they uh, see this name Jeconiah in the genealogy. Who's ever seen this before? Everyone know what I'm talking about? Okay. Jeconiah, they say, cannot be uh, in this genealogy because according to Jeremiah 22.30, this man was cursed. He, not a faithful man, not a man of God, uh, and here's the prophecy against him. Thus saith the Lord, write this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. So they say, well, how can Jesus be, how can Jesus be uh, the adopted son of Joseph and be the legitimate king of Israel? How can that happen when that kingly line was cursed evermore from Jeconiah onward? And um, I think the answer here is that Joseph's line uh, goes all the way back to King Solomon and then to King David. Jeconiah in there, the cursed one, yes, he, he's in there. But in Luke's gospel, we get a different genealogical list. This goes back from Jesus up through Mary and then back to King David, not through Solomon, but through Nathan. And what happens here, because Jesus was virgin born, 
uh, he circumvents that curse. He is not really uh, of the seed of Jeconiah. He, Jesus doesn't have a, a, a human male father. And in this way, um, we get around this sort of quote, this quote unquote contradiction here. There is no contradiction. And in fact, this is, I think this contradiction is reconciled so wonderfully by the virgin birth doctrine and by the fact that we, we probably have two different genealogical lists here. Uh, one through Joseph's line, the other one through Mary's line, uh, that you'd have to be a, pretty much a super intellect to put all this together. Okay? And that's just one of, this is one of the contradictions, quote unquote contradictions that I've heard. And, um, but if you get Josh McDowell's uh, New Evidence that Demands a Verdict, uh, he goes into this in even greater detail. But at least you get barking up the right tree here. So any questions about that? I, don't, I just don't see a problem here. Okay. Now, the other uh, supposed contradiction, now again, I mean, there's lots of these, right? I'm just blasting off the common ones and the ones that aren't that hard with the time we have uh, to understand here today. But one of them uh, concerns the nativity of Christ. And um, if you read Matthew's gospel, you have a chronology there. Jesus is uh, born in Bethlehem, remember? Uh, and then next thing you know, he's... He seems a little bit older. He seems to be a child. He's called a child, and he's not in a manger anymore. He's in a house. And, uh, and he gets a visit from some wise men. Remember that? So Jesus, born in Bethlehem. A little bit of time passes. We're not sure how much. But next thing you know, he has a visit from uh, the wise men from the east. And then he has to immediately, his family has to go to Egypt and uh, they stay in Egypt for a little while because Herod wants to kill the baby Jesus. And then after Herod's dead, they return back to the Holy Land and they decide they're going to they're live in Nazareth. Okay, how, how many people remember that? So that's very definitely the chronology, right? But if you read Luke's Gospel, it seems like we have a, a total different chronology going on there and a different series of events. You have Jesus born in Bethlehem. Shepherds come to see him when he's just a little baby. Uh, after eight days, there's his circumcision and uh, naming. Forty days later, he goes to the temple, and he's presented there. And remember, Simeon and Anna uh, see him, and, he is, and they have some words to say, some prophecy. Um, and then uh, they're off to Nazareth. Next thing you know, they're going to go live in Nazareth. And it seems like one, guy, one gospel writer doesn't know what the other one knows about the early life of Jesus and how are you supposed to put all this together and some people see a real contradiction there I've, I've read stuff on the internet well, this, this is irreconcilable and this is just my reasoning here I mean think about this yourself uh, you can easily easily put together a chronology of the early years of Jesus based on the data that you see there in Matthew and Luke and there's no, absolutely no contradiction at all. Neither of those two guys, Matthew or Luke, is claiming to give you all the facts about Jesus' life. Uh, and what historian ever would try to do that? Okay, I don't want to go too fast here, but do you understand what I'm saying? When a historian is going to write history, he selects from all that he could write, he's going to select what he thinks is, is important. Uh, and he's going to obviously leave out some things. It, that's, that's just part of doing history, right? So uh, neither one of those guys, and even John comes right out and tells you at the end of his gospel, Jesus did so many things that are not written in this book. You know, he, but John says, I've written these things so that you might believe, and believing you may have life. I've been selective. John says, comes right out, I've been selective in what I'm teaching you guys. Every historian has to be. But uh, if you take a look at Matthew... Matthew gives you the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, and Luke gives you the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. Matthew doesn't talk about the shepherds coming to adore Jesus, but Luke does. That's immediately following his birth. Shepherds come. Uh, eight days later, a circumcision. Luke tells you about the circumcision. Uh, and then 40 days later, uh, Jesus, 
he's presented in the temple in Jerusalem. Bethlehem is like five miles from Jerusalem. It's not that far. <laughs> it's not like he has to go across the world some, somewhere, okay? Born in Bethlehem, city of David, circumcised 40 days later at the temple for presentation. Um, and then I say they return to Bethlehem. That's where they're going to be raising Jesus. That's what they figured. He's the Messiah. He's the son of David. Micah 5.2 says Messiah comes from Bethlehem. Uh, I think they had every intention of raising him there. So uh, the way I see it, they just brought him back to Bethlehem. And they stayed there for a couple of years, and then comes the wise men. Uh, we know that some time has passed because he's, he's called a little child. He's not called it like a, a newborn baby anymore. And he's no longer in the manger when the wise men come to see him. He's in a house. Okay? So a couple of years pass. They're, they're back in Bethlehem. That's when the, the wise men come to adore him. Uh, and then everybody's warned in a dream to get out of here because uh, Herod's going to come try to kill Jesus. And there's a flight into Egypt where they stay until Herod is dead. Uh, and then off to Nazareth. They, they, they head back for the Holy Land. Uh, they don't think it's quite safe to remain in the south, so they head north to Nazareth. And here you have a perfectly consistent, well-integrated uh, chronology. You put the two Gospels together, I just don't see any conflict at all. I don't know if you guys do. If you see a conflict, you can tell me. We can talk about it. Maybe I need to revise something in my thinking. I just don't think this is that hard, actually. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Uh, now, a different uh, contra so-called contradiction here involves... Let's see, which one am I going to choose here? <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, I'd like to show you something here. Who's ever, who remembers this, ever seeing this book here? Farewell to God. You ever see that book? Charles Templeton? Charles Templeton was a, uh, a preacher. He was an evangelist. He was a colleague of Billy Graham. Uh, and then he rejected Christianity, walked away from Christianity, died in apostate, and um, wrote this book before he died, Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. And this is what he says here on page 118. A careful examination of the gospel accounts of, the res of Christ's resurrection leads inescapably to the conclusion that they lack authenticity, they are mutually contradictory, were written long after Jesus' death and are no more than legends. As is evident, the four descriptions of the events differ, uh, descriptions of events after the resurrection differ so markedly at so many points that with all the goodwill in the world, they cannot be reconciled. So I think I'd like to take a look at the resurrection, uh, the, the four counts given to us and Paul's statements. And I'd like to propose a way that we might reconcile all this together. Now, I just want to say this. If we're treating the Bible just as a historical document and not as God's word, we just say it's just a historical document telling us what happened in, in the ancient world, all these contradictions, you could admit them. You could say, yeah, we have contradictions here. And you know what that would do? That would do nothing, really, to undermine uh, the reliability of the, of the New Testament at its core. Uh, because what these things agree on, the core things are really the most important things. Um, that Jesus was crucified, he was put in a tomb, a gaggle of women came to the tomb, found it empty, you know? Uh, and then he was seen alive by some people. Uh, the secondary details about who was there first and so on, um, you could admit those as contradictions, and by the standards of uh, ancient historiography, that would do nothing to undermine your confidence in the general reliability of the New Testament record. Okay? Uh, and I have a quote from uh, Ian Wilson. He wrote a book called uh, Jesus, the Evidence. And I'll see if I could just call that up here quickly here. But this is what Ian Wilson said, and he, he's written two editions of this book at least. But he says, ironically, it has not been the theologians, but the outsiders, such as the scholars of ancient history, 
well used to the imperfections in the works of pagan writers of antiquity who have been most prepared to recognize the strong vein of authenticity underlying the Gospels. So um, when it comes to ancient standards of history, historiography and so on, um, we can admit contradiction. You know, uh, in secondary, peripheral uh, details, we can admit that. And it would do nothing to undermine the basic reliability of the core of what uh, the documents are trying to tell us. Now, I personally, um, I personally don't believe there are any contradictions in the Bible because it's not just a normal historical document. Uh, it's God's perfect word, right? Um, but nevertheless, it takes, some, uh, it takes some imagination and it takes some, um, some deep reflection to try to harmonize some of this. And I may have gotten it wrong. I'm going to offer you uh, my chronology of resurrection events. Yeah, if it doesn't look right to you, uh, go home and think about it. Come up with a better one. No problem. <laughs> you know, I could be wrong on this. That's okay. Um, now, before we look at the uh, resurrection chronology, I, I just want to throw something out to you here. Anyone, every, anyone recognize that man there? That's Dwayne Gish. Anyone recognize Dwayne Gish? He was just a little fella, uh, biochemistry professor. Um, he died in 2013. And I love Dwayne Gish. He traveled and did uh, debates at universities on evolution creation. And, um, and he won. I think he won every time. And... Um, he was a pretty comical guy, too, <laughs> you know. But um, if you go to the Institute for Creation Research website, there's a, there is like a tribute to Duane Gish. And this is what it says. Dr. Gish had an eternal impact, and the entire creation ministry will miss him, especially his ICR family. He leaves a wife, Lolly, four children by his deceased first wife, also named Lolly, Nine grandchildren, three great-grandchildren, and hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands, thousands of intellectual children who are advocates of biblical and scientific creation. He was not a large man, but stood as a giant in defense of scriptural authority. Well done, Dr. Dwayne Gish, well done. And, um, yeah, you know, if I'm not careful, I just start, get, go off on a big rabbit trail about Dwayne Gish. But I love that guy. He, he's a great man. Uh, in the family of God. But um, I'm sure you've caught this. I've got it highlighted in yellow for you. His first wife was named Lolly. Now that is a very odd name. How many Lollies have you run into? And he had children with Lolly. And then he married a second wife, also named Lolly. Now if you didn't know, if you didn't know a whole lot about Dwayne Gish, just little snippets of his life, and someone asked you some questions, how do you think you might answer those questions? When did Dwayne marry Lolly? Depends. <laughs> Is Lolly Dwayne's first wife or second? Is Lolly the actual mother of Dwayne's children or their stepmother? Interesting question. Did Lolly die before or after Dwayne? Uh huh. Uh, I heard a story, William Lane Craig shares a story about a woman who um, she got hit by a bus. She was severely injured. She got hit by a bus. Uh, and then she was put into an ambulance and rushed to the hospital. The ambulance got into an accident. And I think she died in that one. Now, think about that. I mean, if you had only... Snip, you know, how did she die? What, did she get, well, she got hit by a bus. Well, no, she didn't. She was in a, in a motor vehicle accident. Well, how did she stay... In her, you know, where, where do those injuries come from? You can just imagine all the contradictions that you might hear. Until you had all the facts... And then you can finger joint them into a chronology. And so that's what we're going to try to do with the uh, resurrection. And I, this is my best attempt. It's not the last word on this, but I think it makes sense to me. And, and we're going to look at this together, okay? Uh, and then we'll get on to something else. A chronology of resurrection events. First thing we hear is... Uh, Mark, Matthew, and Luke tell us that Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of, of Joseph, beheld where Jesus was laid. There was, and there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. 
And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So it becomes very clear to me that uh, Christ's women followers were planning to meet at Jesus' tomb early in the morning on the first day of the week. That was their plan. They were watching where he was interred. I mean, th th there goes out the window the, the wrong tomb idea. Remember that? They must have went to the wrong tomb. The Gospels are very clear. They observed Jesus being buried. They, they didn't go to the wrong tomb. Uh, that's not why it was empty. <laughs> they went to the right tomb, and it really was empty. Now, Matthew 28 uh, it says, At the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord had descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Um, that's Matthew's account. Now, as I look at that, I understand it to be saying that the angel came and rolled away the stone and sat on it before the ladies arrived at the tomb. Only the guards saw the angel and they shook with fear and became as dead men. I think Matthew just wants us to know that it was that angel that later spoke to the women. Okay, the, so the women didn't see the earthquake and the angel pushed the stone. We're just hearing from Matthew that the angel that did this is the guy that talked to the women. Okay, only the uh, guards were there to watch the spectacle. Okay? Now, John's Gospel, chapter 20, says the first person at the tomb is Mary Magdalene. She probably came with somebody else, though. Okay, the first day of the week uh, comes Mary Magdalene early while it was still yet dark to the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. And she runs and comes to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, that's John, whom Jesus loved and said to him, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we do not know where they have laid him. So they, she's probably with someone else there. But she runs and gets uh, uh, Peter and John. At the end of the Sabbath, this is... Uh, uh, from the uh, Mark's gospel, Matthew Mark's gospel. At the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to the, see the sepulcher. So she's there with somebody else. She's not there totally by herself. Mark says, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet, sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. Luke says, it was very early in the morning they came to the sepulcher bringing spices that they had prepared. Uh, so the report is made to Peter and John. Peter and John run to the tomb. This is John chapter 20. Uh, they reach the tomb and uh, Peter goes in and then John enters after him. They see the grave clothes lying by themselves. John believes. John, has, John believes that Christ is risen. Uh, they return to their homes. The other lady, which is probably the other Mary, probably left as well. And Mary's left alone there at the tomb. While she's alone at the tomb, looking in, she sees two angels. One at the, where Jesus' feet might have been, and one where his head, head would have been. Two angels where Jesus would have laid. I kind of see something like the Ark of the Covenant there. Two cherub, hey? Isn't Jesus called the propitiation for our sins? The hilasterion, the mercy seat. One angel on either side of where the body of Jesus, our mercy seat, would have been. And they said to her, Woman, uh, why weepest thou? She says unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had said thus, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. So Mary is the first one. She's there at the tomb by herself, and um, she sees Jesus. That's what Mark 16 and verse 9 says. When Jesus was risen on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. And again, that's pretty, um, that's embarrassing. If this is a, a fabrication, you expect Peter or John to be there seeing Jesus alive, not Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had to cast seven devils. And Jesus told her, Go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. 
As Mary was leaving, the other women arrived at the tomb, I believe, to anoint the body, Mark 16, 1, at which point it was became, uh, beginning to become dawn, Matthew 28, verse 1. This group included the other Mary, the mother of James, Salome, and Joanna. They also saw the stone rolled away. And very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. In fact, one ancient manuscript from uh, the fourth century says in the, in the margin, the stone was so heavy, 20 men could not roll it. I don't know if that's true, but they really wanted to keep him in there, so it might be true. Who knows? Uh, and they entered in, and they found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed about uh, thereabout, behold, there stood... Uh, two men in shining garments and entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side. So according to Luke 24, two men in garments, Mark 16, a young man sitting on the right side. If there's two men, there's at least one. Okay? Uh, this is not a contradiction. If, you're, if there's two guys and you're only talking to one guy, you might record only the conversation you had with the one. That doesn't mean there's only one it means I'm just telling you about the conversation I had with that guy, with just one. Make sense? Uh, my friend Phil Fernandez spent many years in law enforcement. He remembers coming onto a scene uh, where there was a serious assault on a guy. Uh, and he was going around with his notebook asking witnesses what happened. And one guy said, yeah, there was, there's these two guys showed up. And um, one of them was kicking the tar out of that poor guy. Really beat him up bad. Okay. He says, okay, so one of them was doing that. Yeah, it was this guy here. He, he did so much damage. And then he talks to a different witness, and he says, two guys were beating up on this poor guy. He said, both of them. Yeah, both of them. So then he goes back to the first witness. He says, you told me there was only, only one guy was doing the assault. And then the first witness says, well, yeah, the other guy just kicked him a couple times. You see? <laughs> yeah, if he didn't pry into this, it, it would have sounded like a contradiction in the testimonies, right? So again, I'm saying if there's two guys, there's at least one. And I think that's what's happening here. Uh, Mark is only talking about the dialogue um, that the ladies are having with one angel. And he says unto them, Be not frightened, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. In Matthew 28, and verse 7 they're told to go quickly and tell the disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goes before you into Galilee. There you shall see him. Lo, I have told you. That's the angel that pushed the stone away. That same angel. Now, you're going to see the instruction was, go, you disciples get to Galilee. Go to Galilee. There's resistance to this. They're not going to go. Um, so Jesus is going to appear to them in Jerusalem. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them met the women, saying, All hail! And they came and, uh, and held him by the feet, not helped him. They held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus to them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brethren that they sh go into Galilee, and there they shall see me. So Jesus really wanted them to go to Galilee. Um, but they, these guys are unbelieving, and they don't go immediately. Okay. Luke 24, 9 says, The women returned from the sepulcher and told these things to the eleven and all the rest. Uh, John chapter 20, verse 19 says, They were all assembled behind closed, door for fe behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. So they're in Jerusalem. They're all bottled up there, afraid uh, of the authorities. So the women went to these uh, eleven men and told them. Uh, and it was Joanne. Uh, Joanna, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and the other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. In John 20, and verse 19, Mary Magdalene uh, is singled out. She came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Mark 16, 9 says the disciples did not believe the women. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. So you get the picture. The women, they've seen angels, they've seen Jesus, they go to Jerusalem, they talk to the eleven, we've seen the Lord. And uh, the, the men don't believe. And their words seemed like idle tales and they believe them not. I think at this point, two of the disciples got up to go to Emmaus. 
we're out of here, we've had it. And Peter also got up. Luke 24, 12 says, then arose Peter and ran to the sepulcher. There's a second visit to the sepulcher by Peter. He's been there once already, he's, he's returned. Then arose Peter and ran to the sepulcher and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laying by themselves and departed wondering at himself at that which was to come to pass. I believe right after he left the sepulcher, Jesus appeared to Peter by himself. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 uh, says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and he was seen of Cephas. That's Peter. He's the first male to see Jesus alive. Paul just omits the women's testimony here. He's trying to build a case, right? And I think right there, uh, Peter was uh, visited by Jesus, and he ran back and reported what he had seen to the people in Jerusalem, to the other disciples. I've seen the Lord. Now you have a male saying, I've seen the Lord. Uh, they also don't believe him. You'll see. Then Jesus appears to the two on the road to Emmaus, but they didn't know him. It says their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Uh, they got to Emmaus and had uh, bread together. Jesus broke the bread. Uh, and then all of a sudden they realized that was Jesus there. It says in Mark 16 and verse 13, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked. That's the two on the road to Emmaus. And they went and told it unto the residue and neither did they believe him. Uh, neither did they believe them. Uh, it says in Luke 24 that they, re that they rose up the same hour, these two in Emmaus, returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Now that's Peter. See? After that second visit to the tomb, the Lord appeared to Peter and he ran back to Jerusalem to say, I've seen the Lord. And these two that went to Emmaus also saw Jesus ran back and this is, they found the whole group talking about it. They returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. So now there's this big discussion going on. By the time the evening rolls around, that same day, we know this is the first day of the week still, the same day, when the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace to you. And when he had said so, or so said, he showed them his hands and his side, and, they, and then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. But Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. I think he, he got tired of all this, and he left. Uh, unbelieving, he left before Jesus appeared. Okay? Uh, so he left. He did not see Jesus uh, appear to them. The other disciples therefore said to him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's John 20, 25. So I believe that the disciples became obedient to the Lord's command. And from there they went to Galilee and um, they convinced Thomas to come with them. You come with us, Thomas. Because eight days later, which is more than enough time to get to Galilee, uh, Jesus appeared to the disciples. This time Thomas was there in Galilee. After eight days, he appeared and he said to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, Thomas, and behold my hands, and reach hither into, uh, thy hand and thrust it into my side. And Thomas there in Galilee, he believed. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Okay? I think that's what's going on there. Afterward, uh, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. I think this is the appearance uh, mentioned to the twelve in 1 Corinthians 15.5 as Matthias would have also been present. Matthias becomes numbered. He becomes one of the twelve. So 20 years after the event, Paul could say he appeared to the twelve. Judas is dead, remember? And Matthias becomes a part of that number there. Um, he's, Jesus is upset here with these people because they did not believe the first witnesses. They didn't believe the women. They didn't believe Peter. They, they were not believing the apostolic witness. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. See, he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Uh, and then after all this, Jesus is seen by 500 brethren at one time, says 1 Corinthians 15, 7. After all this, he is seen by James 
uh, and then of all the apostles. That's, that's a pretty good chronology, I think. John 21.4 says they were in Galilee, still in Galilee, uh, and they were out fishing, fished all night, caught nothing, and then in the morning they saw Jesus on the shore and had fish sandwiches for breakfast. Jesus uh, reinstated Peter to the apostleship at that time. Okay. Uh, and then after that, uh, he is seen for a total of 40 days. Luke says he was seen by uh, many infallible proofs, which in Greek signifies the strongest form of legal evidence. So, so uh, Luke says Jesus showed himself alive. It was unmistakable. It was infallible. Uh, and during those 40 days... He gave them the great commission to preach the gospel to every creature, to make disciples and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, he affirmed his supremacy. He said, all, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He offers uh, words of encouragement to his disciples. Uh, and he instructed his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit just before his ascension into heaven. And then, uh, after giving those final instructions, he was taken up uh, into heaven uh, and carried up in front of them. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting. There's no other appearances of Jesus, no other physical appearances until we hear from Paul. Paul, on the road to Damascus, gets a, gets a glimpse of the resurrected Jesus. And then that's it. No more corporeal appearances of Jesus. Uh, maybe visions. Uh, Stephen sees a vision of Jesus there standing at the right hand of God, but no more appearances where he sits down and breaks bread or invites you to give him something to eat or touch him. Uh, obviously, these are, not, these are not intended to be understood as hallucinations. These are real, physical, corporeal appearances of a resurrected Jesus, see? That's my, chrono that's a, that's my chronology. Again, if you go to equip you, I think it's year one, session, whatever, six, just go, just look at, uh, on our website, equip you, year one. Um, I think it's year one. We, we look at this in much more detail, and I have all this chronology written, off, written out for you in PDF. So you can, you can print it off, look at it, take it, lay it beside your Bible, and f see if you can piece it together better than that. If you can, great, we'll talk about it. Uh, but I think these are, this is a reasonable way to put this stuff together. I think the Gospels are in, in agreement on what happened there. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments about any? any yeah. There's one place that's kind of described it, Mary Magdalene. Yeah. She, they, came, they come to the tomb first thing in the morning. She sees Jesus after several things have happened. Right. Like, how is, how is that? Then she's among the women who go and tell us. Like, right. I, I think... I think Mary showed up there with at least one other person, right? And then she ran, she ran to get Peter and John. And they came to the tomb and looked around, and then they left, right? Um, I think she sees Jesus. She has this encounter with Jesus. And then the, other women, then the other women return to the tomb, and she's silent about what she saw. That's a potential problem. Um, but I don't think it's insurmountable. I think she might have been so impressed by what she had seen with angels and a vision, a visions of angels and seeing Jesus, she might have been speechless um, when those ladies got there. And that, that is a potential problem, and I do have that here. Uh, let's see if I can get to it. Does it ever say that any women come to the tomb that it's not the right of the I've never, I don't see that in the scripture. So here... Um, Well, I'll just, you know what, I'll just go through with what I got here, okay? Because I have, there's a couple of potential problems. Um, potential problem one, I think, is, the, is um, that on my chronology, Mary Magdalene has a visit, visitation of both angels and the Lord Jesus uh, before the women arrive at the tomb. Uh, Mark 16, verses 1 to 3 says, uh, they were saying amongst themselves, who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Now, on my chronology... Mary has already seen the stone rolled away. So why in the world would she be asking, who's going to move the stone? Right? Why would she be asking that? She's already, seen, uh, she's already been there. I think Mark's writing style may provide the answer. Here's a strict chronology. You have events following each other. Event 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Mark's writing style seems to be something like this. Throughout Mark's gospel, you'll find this. 
He, he tells you about event one, event two, event three, event four, and then he jumps back and gives you some more information about event three again. So the chronology is interrupted with past background information. Uh, for example, Mark chapter six, uh, Jesus sends out the 12, they do miracles, Herod hears of Jesus and he thinks it's John. He thinks John's back from the dead. Uh, and then you get this account of John's execution. Now, that's already happened. John's already been executed. And yet we get this additional information that sort of interrupts the narrative. Uh, and then after that, the narrative resumes and the disciples return and there's the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, same thing, in, even within a single uh, little block of scripture, Mark does it uh, in Mark chapter 5 when Jesus encounters a demoniac. Uh, it says here, Mark 5 verse 6, but when, they, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice, saying, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Now, again, we're kind of going backwards. We get this chronology uh, where Jesus encounters the demoniac, and the demoniac is pleading with him. And then, we, then Mark explains why he's pleading, because Jesus had said, Come out of him. So it's, we're backing up. And we're getting more information. Uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 25. A certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had was nothing better but grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I might touch his clothes, I shall be whole. Uh, See, we're going back in time again. She's already touched his garment. But then Mark tells us about something she was thinking before she touched the garment. Uh, Same thing in Mark 3. For the multitude comes together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay lay hold on him, for they said he is beside himself. See, they're setting out to to pull Jesus out of danger, but they already thought before that he's crazy. He's beside himself. Uh, Same thing in Mark 9. And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, what was it that you disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace for by the way they had disputed amongst themselves who should be the greatest. We've already arrived. We're already in the house. But we're hearing about what they talked about uh, along the way. So the women purposed to anoint Jesus' body even as they viewed his internment in the sepulcher. I think from that point on they were probably continually asking themselves who's going to move the stone from us. I think that is one way but we might reconcile the difficulty here. Mark is just simply uh, letting us know that Mary was wondering who was going to move that stone away uh, prior to her arrival at the tomb. I think he might be backing up and letting us know what she was thinking. Well, the, all the women were thinking. She comes to the tomb, Mark 16, yeah. Very, very early in the morning. Right. And then after some events transpire, she runs and gets the Right. Then she sees in the right. So I, I think she has an account. I, it makes sense that all the women came all together. Yeah, that, that's one way to do it. Uh, I've heard others. Come at the same time. Yeah, I know other apologists look at it that way. It's it's legitimate. <laughs> this is John Feeks giving you an attempted chronology, right? Um, I bark up the same tree as Norm Geisler, but I know I think Josh McDowell has a different way. His way sounds more like yours. I think the women came back to, uh, to the tomb when Mary had already had her encounter uh, with Jesus, and she was silent. And that's a potential problem number two. I'll just spit it out here, and then um, we'll take our break, and we'll get on to something a little easier. <laughs> okay. Potential problem two is Mary's silence. On my chronology, Mary Magdalene has had a visitation of both angels and the Lord Jesus uh, before the other women arrive at the tomb, and they receive uh, a visitation. Why is she silent uh, while the angels address the, gr- uh, the group of women. Why doesn't she share what she has seen? Uh, well, look at Luke 24, beginning at verse 2. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in, and they found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid, they bowed down their faces to the earth. And they said to them, Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? Uh, this, this image is so spectacular 
the women can hardly say anything. They, they have their faces in the dirt. And it was Mary Magdalene, Johanna, and Mary the mother of James, and the other women which were with them, which told these things to the apostles. Uh, when an angel shows up, it's a pretty spectacular thing. Uh, it's a scary thing. Uh, in Luke chapter 1, an angel appeared to Zacharias in the temple, and he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. I mean, he was crippled with fear. In John, uh, Revelation chapter 19, the apostle John twice bows down to worship an angel, which, he, I mean, he's sternly rebuked for doing that. So I kind of think that it might be the case that the angel's appearance was so spectacular that Mary was just frankly speechless. She was trying to figure out what had just happened to her. Uh, maybe she just didn't have words. I don't know. Anyway, this is one way that we might plausibly reconcile some of this. There may be better ways to do it. I'm just throwing it out there. Okay? But I know uh, Norm Geisler looks at it kind of this way. Um, Josh McDowell doesn't. He has a different way to do it. This is, to me, it's a joyful, lifelong thing to search the scriptures um, and try to understand uh, what God is trying to tell us here and w try to understand what exactly happened. Um, and if we, don't come up, if we can't in this lifetime come up with uh, a chronology that we can be rock solid certain about, you can be certain that when you see Jesus face to face, he's going to explain it to you. <laughs> okay? So that's, uh, anyway, that's my attempt at that. Uh, when we return from the break, uh, I want to look at this idea that the Gospels are, um, that they're just a product of pagan influence. Because that is really big nowadays. Who's ever heard of the Zeitgeist movie? Anybody hear of Zeitgeist? Okay. We want to look at that when we return from the break. Any questions or anything that you're just itching to talk about before we break? Anything? Okay, guys, take 10 minutes, uh, and then we'll return and look at some more stuff.